Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to Tech Gig Webinars, our endeavor to empower techies. We believe that sharing of knowledge is the key of enhancing our performances and for our growth as professionals. With this principle in mind, Tech Gig has initiated a series of webinars conducted by industry experts to give a crisp insight of various domains. Today's session is third in the webinar series on business intelligence giving insights into predictive analytics using regression. We are delighted to have Mr. Abhya Khan Srivastav with us today. Mr. Abhya is Solution Architect at EXCL Services. Abhya has over five years of experience in the areas of predictive analytics, data mining, statistical modeling, basal to risk governance and related areas across verticals like retail banking, credit card, mortgage insurance and healthcare. He is also involved in collaborative research in data analytics using different tools like SAS, R and MATLAB. Abhay holds bachelor's in statistics degree from BHU and master's in stati statistics from IIT Kanpur. Gentlemen, this presentation will continue for next one hour and we will take your questions after the presentation. In the meanwhile, you can post your queries through the chat pane available in the webinar software. Without further ado, I introduce you to our guest speaker, Mr. Abhay. Good afternoon, everybody. Uh, before going to the uh, our predictive analysis presentation, uh, let me introduce myself. Uh, my name is Avakant Srivastav and uh, I am working with EAXL services as a manager analytics. Uh, I, have uh, I have done my graduation in statistics from BHU and master in statistics from IIT Kanpur. And I have uh, around six years of experience in predictive analysis using SAS and more in advanced analytics. <laughs> Today we are going to discuss that how can we use regression analysis for our prediction, for forecasting and how can we <coughs> deal with the big data in SAS, what are the different code, what are different regression tools, what are different methodology techniques. We will continue this session till one hour and any questions as you know, organizer told that you can post through chat and at the end of the session I'll answer those questions. So let's proceed for uh, our session. So regression modeling. We all uh, deal with large data sometime and it could be from any domain, it could be from retail banking, it could be from any banking data, healthcare data and any any kind of data and when we get the large information through the data, so first thing comes up that what kind of insight we can provide to our, you know, customer, to our client and to ourselves also to understand what's happening with the data. <laughs> For that, we do uh, use lots of techniques. So one of the statistical <coughs> technique is regression modeling. <coughs> In regression modeling, uh, the basic agents, what are the basic assumptions, what is regression, uh, what kind of output looks like, how we build up the model, uh, something we'll discuss today. So, on the first slide, it's regression modeling. So establishing a functional relationship between a set of explanatory or independent variables like x1, x2, xp with a response or dependent variable y. So we can say that there could be a relationship between a dependent variable y and the set of independent variables xis. And xis are x1 to xp. 
So we will see what can be those exercise and how can we predict why using this linear relationship. Why do we need to build a model? Because knowledge of why is crucial for decision making but is not deterministic. X is available at the time of decision making and is related to Y. So anything, let's say we want to predict anything, let's say sales or anything, then we have the large information of our past. Based on those past information that is excise for us, we predict our Y. It could be anything like sales, number of computers sold in the market, something like that. We'll further discuss this in details. A functional relationship between Y and X gives an idea about the otherwise non-deterministic Y. So our main aim is to select those informative exercises which can predict our Y. Examples. You run a leasing business. A customer has come to you and asked for funding. The lease. Question. Should we grant him her or the lease? So it could be that answer could be yes or no. So what kind of regression technique would be there, we'll discuss. Non-deterministic why. Chances that the customer will default on his payments. The maximum amount that we may approve. Known information, what we have to predict these non-deterministic whys are information on credit history, past transactions, financial status of the customer, we might have the demographic information, so lots of information. The more information we'll have, we can, we can so we can discuss those information in detail that how can those exercises would be able to predict why in detail. So a functional relationship between Y and X helps in deciding whether to fund the deal or not and how much fund we will approve. Nature of variable. An explanatory variable could be numerical, could be categorical. If it's numerical, so there could be discrete and continuous variable like number of satisfactory trades, highest credit lines. In categorical, we can have the ordinal and nominal variables like income group, gender, and a dependent variable could be continuous, discrete, and binary. In continuous, that is the total amount that we may approve for funding. Discrete, number of equipments that may be funded. So it could be, answer could be yes or no. Something like defaulter, non-defaulter, smoker, non-smoker, good and bad. Binary, whether the customer would default on payment or not. So we'll see how, what kind of technique we'll use in continuous and what kind of technique we'll use in binary. So there are types of regression. And in all the types of regression, our main aim is to predict Y using those X. So there could be two kind of, you know, dependent variable, which we discussed in last slide, that it could be continuous or binary. In continuous, it could be sales volume, claim amount, number of equipments, percentage increase in growth, etc. In binary, it could be buy, no buy, delinquent, non-delinquent, growth, no growth, etc. So when we deal with continuous, it ordinarily just a square regression we'll discuss here today. And when we deal with binary, we, discuss, uh, we deal with logistic regression. So what's the OLS? So linear regression analysis. It's a, it's a continuous regression analysis actually where our dependent variable y takes a continuous distribution. So as you see, the equation yi equal to beta naught plus beta 1 xi, x1 i plus beta 2 x2 i, so on and so forth plus epsilon i. So in the short form, if you use the matrix notation, it could be y equal to x beta plus epsilon. So here y is our dependent variable which we gonna predict. X are those informations and beta is the unknown parameter which we will estimate using our, you know, modeling technique in SAS to get those y and the epsilon is the error terms which we cannot handle and we, our aim is to minimize these errors as much as possible to predict our y in a better way. So the minimum is epsilon, the better is y. 
So here, epsilon has uh, assumptions that it will, will be normally distributed with mean zero and constant variance. The, so y is dependent variable, si's are independent variables, epsilon is the error terms. Observe that the model is linear in the coefficients beta. So when I say the linear in the coefficients beta, so your parameter estimates beta should be the linear could not be in the quadratic form or cubic form, otherwise it would be a nonlinear regression shift. So that's what we mean by linearity and this is what the simple linear regression is all about in, and in the form of equation. So this is how the scatter plots looks like. If you plot your x with uh, versus y, you can get these kind of you know plots that one is the you know randomly distributed so we cannot exactly tell that is there any relationship or not. In the second plot, you see the negative relationship means that if you are putting the positive information, you are predicting in a negative direction. We'll see how we'll get those results. Then there is a curvilinear relationship and how there is another technique for you know predicting this curvilinear relationship. And the fourth is positive relationship when your x, information x is increasing, your y is also increasing. So we'll deal with the negative relationship and positive relationship that is the linear regression for us on, in our today's presentation. So example of re, uh, regression relations. Example, let's say STDO levels in the urine of near-term pregnant women can be used to predict infant birth weight. The third example is the selling price of a house is related to square footage among other things. So these are the examples where we will see how can we, you know, uh, fit the regression equations because in all these examples we do see that our dependent variable y is continuous and the information are providing in terms of in third example it's related to square footage of home, so lots of information of home for that customer, etc. So this is a linear regression model. The model has a deterministic and a probabilistic component. So if you see then house cost is on y-axis, house size is on x-axis and most plots sell for $25,000. So a building house cost about $75 per square feet means house cost is equal to 25,000, it's a you know, constant term and plus 75 into size because per square foot uh, size is costing around $75. So how can we fit this equation that how much house cost we're going to predict in future when we are going to build a house? How your cost vary even among same size of houses because the material, the kind of construction, it could be different. So when I say that the materials, the kind of construction, so these are the different x size which are going to predict the y. Here y is house cost. So the house cost can be dependent on different kind of excise and how much information we'll get about those excise will be better to predict. Since cost we have unpredictably, we add a random component because let's say we started making our house today, but when we are going to predict after some time, the cost are varying. So it's a you know, unpredictable component. General concept, linear model is looks like y equal to beta naught plus beta 1 x plus epsilon where our y is dependent, x independent as we discussed, our beta naught is intercept, beta 1 is slope and epsilon is error term. As you look at the graph that beta 1 is equal to rise divided by run if y and x, y is on y axis and x is on this. So beta 1 is a kind of slope. So assumption about the random error component to build up the linear regression. The error is a critical part of the regression model. Four requirements involving must be satisfied. The probability distribution of epsilon is normal. That 
means that y equal to x beta plus epsilon then error terms should be normally distributed with mean 0 the second point and the standard deviation should be constant for all x arrays and the set of errors associated with different values of y are all independent so it should be identically and independent distributed the least square regression line when we fit the y fitted equal to beta naught plus beta 1 x i is the fitted regression line. Here we don't see the error term. It means when we build up the model, we somehow compute the, you know, x and that how much we are going to minimize, predict our y. And the total residual which we say that uh, sum of square due to error is summation your actual y minus your predicted y square and we al also report when we build up the model that what kind of you know uh, uh, standard error we are getting what kind of uh, root mean square error we are getting based on that we report that how better our model is fitted or not simple linear regression line so let's say let's take example of car so car dealers want to find the relationship between the odometer reading and the selling price of used cars so in, in the chart you can see the different cars different odometer reading and prices a random sample of 100 cars is selected and the data recorded then find the regression line so we can see this kind of output gets generated when we deal with the simple linear regression line and we fit y and x in SAS. So we get this kind of summary output. And this is how we get the equation y fitted is equal to intercept minus 0.0623x. So 0.0623 is the beta which we discussed in our last slide that what could be the you know parameter estimate. So we are estimating our parameter beta naught which is intercept and beta 1 which is slope and uh, our x is odometer here only. So on the basis of this equation we can see that how the car prices varies, right. So there uh, this is the this is the output uh, which we generate at the end of the you know when we fit the linear regression model. This is the how the output looks like in SAS when we fit the you know SAS uh, in in uh, regression in SAS. We'll see the code in the you know in our appendix session. How, what could be the pro regression code? What could be the options there? And this is how when we fit our y versus x. So you see that there are lots of things coming up uh, when we uh, fit the SAS. So there are model, error, correlated table, mean square, f value, root mean square, r square, parameter estimates. In parameter estimate session, which is the last part, you can see there is a variable intercept, which is the, your beta, uh, beta naught, then x1, x2, which we are estimating in parameter estimate part, which is beta, uh, beta 1, beta 2, and then we get the standard error for those parameter estimates, and then t value on the basis of that, you know, model uh, gets the decision that our hypothesis for the model, uh, for that parameter estimate is good or not, we are going to reject or do not reject that, para, uh, that x. So, Basically, on the basis of the t value, we define the probability values. So, probability at mod of t says that this variable should come in model or not. So, if the probability greater than mod of t, it means that we can decide a cutoff bar on this value. So, let's say you want to fit a model on the basis of 99% confidence interval, then your probability greater than mod of t should take value less than 0.01. If you want to fit your model based on 95% confidence interval, so your mod, your probability greater than mod t value should be less than 0 0.05, something like that. So this is the, you know, how the interpretation of the linear regression equation. When we fit the model, we get y cap equal to intercept minus the parameter estimate multiplied by x. So you can see that 
you know how we are going to interpret so do not interpret the intercept as the price of cars that have not been driven this is the slope and 0 0.0623 is this is the slope of the line for each additional mile on the odometer the price decreased by an average of this so if you increase one unit then it would be decreased by dollar 0 0.0623 so this is what we are getting a negative relationship between y and x that when your odometer is increasing then your then your y is decreasing So we saw the output of regression analysis. There was a term R square, that is the coefficient of determination. We will discuss one to slide on the coefficient of determination that how it could be important for our discussion that model is well fitted or not. So coefficient of determination to understand the significance of this coefficient node. Over our variability in Y is explained in the part of y through the regression model and through the unexplained part that is the error. So if we say that y is equal to x beta plus epsilon, so the over our variability in y is part of two things. One is the regression model and one is the error. So sum of is so the total sum explained is the total sum due to regression and plus total sum due to the error. So R square is the measures the proportion of the variation in Y that is explained by the variation in X. We have a formula for R square that is the 1 minus sum of the square due to error divided by sum of the square due to actual value minus predicted value O square. So if you see the last equation SSR divided by summation YI minus Y bar square so R square is sum of square due to decreaser divided by sum of square due to actual minus predicted value. R square takes on any value between 0 to 1. So the range of R square is 0 to 1. R square is one perfect match between the line and the data points. R square 0, there are no linear relationship between X and Y. So when we see the SAS output and when we see at the R square value, so the more is R square, our model is well fitted, means we are predicting Y in a robust and stable way. So let's say, but it might be that you are getting a R square of let's say 0 0.9395. That it, it's not that if you are getting a R square of 0 0.93, 0 0.98, then it's a great result for you, because it might be that your model is overfitting. So it should be in a valid range around 80, 80% to 90% or 0 0.8, 0 0.85, something like that. So depend on the different scenarios, what kind of, you know, why we are going to predict, what we have as a X size, the R square can be varies. But the thumb rule is that the better is R square, the better is model. So this was all about the you know, linear regression ship and we'll see the SAS code in the appendix part. I just wanted to tell you where we can use the linear regression, what kind of variables should come under Y, what kind of variables should come under X size. I was least focused on the linear regression because most of the time in industry we use the logistic regression modeling. So I'll discuss in more detail about the logistic regression model. So as we see that when our y is binary, then we go through the logistic regression that we are going to buy or no buy, delinquent, no delinquent, growth, no growth, etc. So logistic regression. So what kind of model equation we get in logistic it's Probability that y is equal to 0 is equal to exponential raised to the power li 
divided by 1 plus exponential raised to the power li, where li is linear relationship between x size and parameter estimates. So, here uh, in linear regression, we wanted to predict a continuous y that how much fund can we approve. So, it could be a number in funding, let's say $10,000. How, what is the car price after 10 years? So, it could be 10 lakhs, right? But here in logic regression, we don't deal with the continuous. So, our output comes like, what is the probability that this, uh, we, uh, you know, the guy will go for default? What is the probability that a man will purchase a Honda City car. So, these kind of, you know, answer will get after fitting the logistic regression model. So, let's say you are dealing with the banking industry and you want to make a probability of default model and you are worried about, you know, for the next year that, let's say you have 15 million customers, so how many are going to default in the next year? So, we can tell fit the logistic regression for each account number to tell that this account is going to default or not. So, these kind of, you know, uh, questions can be answered using logistic regression. Assumptions for logistic regression are y i's are independent for all i not equal to j means that <coughs> there should be independent and identical distribution parameters to be estimated. So, we need to estimate again the parameters A, B1, B2, B, P that like we estimated in the linear regression model and then we will fit in model equation probability Y, I equal to 0 and we'll get a, you know, probability value. Method of estimation is maximum likelihood estimation. While in the linear regression set, we deal with the ordinary least square regression. So, because logistic regression now is a non-linear regression, so we cannot deal with the OLSE, that is the ordinary least square estimation. For that, the scientists developed a new methodology to come up with, uh, to calculate the logistic regression and that method is called the method of estimation using the maximum likelihood. This is how the logistic regression curve will look like. We saw the linear regression curve, which was a straight line in positive, negative, something like that. But he, because it, that was a continuous scale distribution, but here it's a probability score distribution, and probability could be from 0 to 1 only. So, the maximum density would be on 0 and 1. So, we will get a kind of S curve. So, we also say the logistic regression curve as a S curve. What is the logistic regression methodology? We will discuss how we build up the models in the logistic regression, how to read the, you know, SAS interpretation, what are the output comes and how we are going to interpret them when we deal with the real life data. So, methodology, logistic model development. We have data. From data, we want to predict that <coughs> yes, no, good, bad, buy, no buy, depends. And for that, we fit the logistic model. So, there are several paths from which we start and go to fit the logistic model. So, first thing is that the observation performance windows, exclusion criteria, good bad definition and finalization. Initial data preparation, data treatment, univariate analysis, data hygiene checks, etc. Phase 1 is missing value treatment, outlier treatment and derived variables identification. His second is fine cleansing and core, coarse cleansing. His three is logistic procedure that what are different steps involved in logistic regression exercise. So, wherever we are building a model, so our best, you know, effort goes to deal with the data. The maximum will play with the data 
will get the good water because at the end of the day when we run any kind of modeling techniques we know what kind of modeling techniques we are going to use and how can we use those techniques in the science but the important question do we understand our data well what kind of tech size are there should we treat them what kind of treatment is there what is the missing value should we compute them or not what is the outlier and how they are going to affect our model how can we treat them so these are the questions which we answer while building the logistic model or any kind of modeling you know methodology because when we get the data it could be a very raw data which is which needs a lot of treatment following these steps which is mentioned in the slide we clean those data we check the data quality check we come up with the raw from raw data to the modeling data when we are 100% sure that our data is now now very clean and we have all y and x size in the way we want the way logistic regression support then only we say that we have done lots of data treatment now the data quality has been done and we can proceed with the logistic regression development methodology so how we decide the observation performance windows what are those exclusion criteria what is good bad definition finalization etc so observation performance window observation window is where the x which are our independent variables come from and performance window is there where the y our dependent variable come from so if you look at the picture given here so our uh, let's say our observation window is from may 04 to may 05 we take exercise from this window to get the information for the prediction of the probabilities in the performance window where y stands and the window is from may 05 to october 05 so at the industry level we deal with the one year observation window and one year performance window but it could be vary it could be vary in different cases in different scenarios it might be you can deal with the one month observation window and predict one year performance window to have one year of observation window and you want next month you know prediction of the probabilities so the performance window and the observation window varies they depend on the business they depend on the methodology they depend on the modeler that how he our business understands the data what is the aim when we want to see the prediction so these kind of answers this kind of questions we solve through this observation and performance window so let's say we have a customer transaction level of regard and their history level of regard let's say up to 10 years so and we want to build up a logistic regression model so it's a modeler and the business who decides that what would be the observation window and what could be the performance window and then out of those 10 years of the data we use we cut the observation window we cut the performance window we clean the data and we merge them to get the <coughs> different observation window and performance window and when we merge that observation window and performance window then we come up with a final data set on which we run the logistic studies exclusion criteria observations from the population that need to be excluded necessary to weed out data bias and to ensure model utility example inactive accounts at observation point to be excluded 
accounts charged of within performance window to be excluded. So let's say, let's take an example that we want to we want to predict the probability of default. So in the next year, and we have a one year of data as observation window. So when we say the observation window means we are talking about the history of those accounts for which we are going to predict the probabilities in the next year. So of course, when we are going to predict the probabilities in next year, so we, we shouldn't take the inactive account because when those accounts are not active, we cannot predict for them. The same way, if the account has already been charged of or has already been defaulted, why will I take those accounts? So for that, we will only take those accounts in the consideration to predict in the performance window who are active in the observation window. And we will take the one year of history will, and based on those history data, we will predict the future. This is the how logistic regression works. Good and bad definition. Definition of why. How do we define a good and bad? So, it's a, it's a only an example, but it might vary in your cases. It might vary in the different domains. Sometimes we deal with the good bad. Sometimes we deal with the default or non-defaulter. Sometimes we deal with the smoker, non-smoker. So, when we get any data, we get the business objective. On the basis of that business objective, we define our why, that what would be best definitions, because when we define why, it's not only that good or bad is a simple straightforward definition. It could be anything. It could be a combination of three, four variables. It could be a combination of three, four definitions. So, depend upon our business requirement, we define our why that what could be good, bad, what could be default or non-default. So, in this case, when we talk about a good, bad, so bad definition of 90% ever plus major drug like bankruptcy, charge of four um, repositions but excluding fraud within the performance window. Goods are defined as anything other than a bad. Simple. So, we have to check what are the, you know, definitions given by the business and accordingly we define our good and bad and that is our why and then we deal with further our methods. Initial data preparation data treatment, univariate analysis, data hygiene checks. So, initial data preparation. Here, we, let's say we have the client data and we are pulling that from server and we get it in different tables. So, let's say as I told that it could be a transaction level data. So, transaction level data could be in different monthly, six yearly, quarterly, yearly format. And we, we get different kind of you know, three tables. Then we, on the basis of some key ID, we merge that table to get a merge data. So let's say we are dealing with any bank data, so it could be account number, right? So it could be account number and based on that account number, we merge that data and get merge data. And on that merge data, we prepare our data treatment and hygiene checks. So we deal with lots of univariate analysis that how the you know univariate look like, how much data are lying where, what is the mean median mode, what are the different top five percentiles, what are the lower percentiles, how the histograms, how the uh, you know dispersion of the data look like. And then we check the hygiene checks that if we want to exclude any of the variables which are not making sense. Yeah, let's say if there is any variable which is very stable, doesn't provide any information, something like that. So lots of hygiene checks depend upon the business scenario and depend upon the, you know, the statistical concept. We deal with those hygiene checks and do the data treatments and then we get the final 
account level data to get our analysis done in logistic regression. Phase one, missing value treatment, outlier treatment and derived value variable identification. So missing value treatment. When we say missing value treatment, so it could be anything. Some there are two kind of missing value treatment. One which we cannot control and second which we can control. When I say about which we cannot control means it it is a very obvious missing values. So let's say a balance of any customer. So let's say he was having a lot, you know, 10,000 on monthly basis, but after a certain period of time, he, he withdraws all the money and his balance is zero, zero. So you cannot say that it's a missing value or zero values because it's a obvious data. So missing value, those where we get the kind of, you know, an obvious data or type data or something like that, then we'll deal with the missing value treatment. So we should be very cautious about dealing with the missing value treatment that on which variable we should deal and which variable not. It is not something like that if you out of 100 variables or uh, 10 variables have the missing value information then you are going to infuse the missing value calculation. You have to look at that variable. You have to understand through the business point of view that missing value is making sense or not. Should we impute or not? So what did missing values? Most of the modeling packages won't consider the observation with missing values in the analysis. Hence, lots of observations might be lost even if a very few have missing values. It is also important from the future scorability point of view. So, let's say we are going to, you know, throw the missing value, so we lost information. So, that's why we treat missing values. There are different ways of handling missing values. We can impute missing values to the mean, minimum, maximum imputation. Fill the missing values of variable with mean or minimum or ma maximum of complete cases. So let's say you have a payment distribution of a person. So payment is variable for account numbers. You cannot put the mean there because, you know, if sometimes he has got a huge amount of payments due to some extra factors and you are putting the mean imputation there, then be a bias. So we have to think that we should use mean, minimum, maximum or not. So most of the time we try to put using the average values, uh, not average value, we try to compute through the median, through the minimum and something like that depends upon the variable and the business. We can create the indicator. We can create new variables, we can use the regression imputation, we can use the cluster mean imputation. So let's say if there are 5% of missing values, then we can put them using median. If there are 5 to 20%, you can use the median or regression imputation. If there are more than 20% and less than 40% of missing values, then you can make an indicator that let's say in sex is a variable and uh, your there is male female and there are 40 30 to 40 percent of data are missing then we can create a flag of unknown that if the data is missing then it would be one right something like that so we can create a flag for missing values and when that variable will come in the model we'll say that let's say that variable came into the model, then we can say that this unknown information, whichever is that, is providing this much information to predict why. The same, so, and second thing that, how can we deal with the extreme value treatment? So we deal with the proxy univariate, provide the box plot option in proxy univariate in SAS, we get a kind of box plot here that our data is li uh, lying where we are getting the zero zero. The one feature in the right corner after box plot option where we see the stars, these are the mis uh, these are the extreme value. We need to treat them. Otherwise, our data, our variable could be biased, and our parameter estimate while estimating the genealogistic model, it could be biased, and we'll get a biased results. So we can use the you know, we can impute these stars using 
mean, median, mode, R, percentile 95, <coughs> P and percentile 1, something like that, used in the minimum and maximum function also. If any of the independent variables contain extreme values, then they need to be treated. Often data entry error might result in extreme values which can be treated easily to make them right from the plot above we can see the discontinuity in the distribution of these values should be further examined to determine if they represent realistic values and we can impute them by median, minimum, maximum depends on the scene. We also come up with the derived variables. So raw variables could be of few types, demographic, product, related, behavioral, anything. From the raw variable, we come up with the derived variable, like using missing values, we came up with the indicator variable. Some variables we can create. So why derived variable? New business relevant variables could be created by certain combinations of raw variables. Example, utilization is a derived variable that is created from balance and credit limit. In, so balance and credit limit was not coming in the model, I thought to make utilization using the balance and credit limit and I got it into model. So we can create lots of derived variables from our raw variables. In certain cases, aggregation variables make more sense rather than stand alone ones. That is, average payments in the last three months, maximum delinquency level in the last three, six months. So it might that average payment in that particular month as a standalone is not coming into the model, but when we take the average, median, moment variable or ratio or delta variable that could be in the model. New variables create and ensure that we capture all the new sense of the data. class are worthy of consideration in the development of the model. Each characteristic is investigated to determine the underlying good bad trends in the data at attribute level for discrete data and in small bands for continuous data. This process brings out the information values for the variables telling us ability of the variable and separate that separate the goods and bad. So let's say we have 50 variables. If we somehow can get that out of those 50 variables, which five variables are giving more information for predicting our why, we are done. So that is what the information value is all about. So we deal with the log R's weight of evidence. Log of R's represent the proportion of goods versus proportion of bads in a particular attribute. So weight of evidence is equal to log of good by bad. And information values is a measurement of how well the characteristic can differentiate between good and bad and whether that characteristic should be considered for modeling or not. So based on this weight of evidence and information value, we can tell that out of the 50 variables, which five variables are giving more information. So you guys can see the Google, you will get a nice code for a bit of evidence and fine classing. So the fine classing continues. So information values, let T and B denote the number of goods and, and number of bats for a given attribute and let J and B the total number of goods and total number of bats respectively in the sample. The following descriptive statistics are used to describe the information values of a particular attribute. So information values is log so good by bad minus bad by good divided uh, multiplied by log of good by bad where small g, capital G, small b and capital B are described above. So if information value is less than 0 0.03, not predictive. Information value is from 0 0.03 to 0 0.1, it's predictive. Information value is greater than 0 0.1, very predictive, huge in modeling. So 
on the basis of these, we can select out of let's say 500 variables, we come up with a certain number of variables. This is how the fine classing output looks like. So let's say the table marginal classing is the account is total accounts, raw percentage total, number of goods, raw percentage goods, number of bats. Then we compute that equation which is in this slide and we come up with the information value. And based on that information value, we say that we should uh, take this variable or not. Even that we are segmenting information values within the variables also. So based on that, we can also make some dummy and indicator variables or kind of other derived variables also. Now as a course classing. Course classing is the grouping together of attributes of characteristics with similar performance in the fine classing output into the course or group. This allows statistically valid groupings to be modeled and allows for fluctuations within characteristics to be smooth out. These courses grouping are called dummy variables. In continuous variable dummies can be used to smooth a trend within a variable that derives from the trend. So, as I discussed in the fine classing that within the information value you can create different kind of dummy variables and derived variables. So, you can see the when, you know, let's say you have a, let's say you have a variable balance and you said that, see that balance versus your y, you plot that and break them into the 20 beans and you see that some of the beans are, you know, increasing with y, some of the bins are decreasing with y, something like that, then you can create a different dummy variable and we can club them together to make a derived variables which will separately predict y and can come up in the model. Dummy creation and correlation. For fine classing and coarse classing procedure helps in identify the dummies to be created. Dumbing is the process of assigning a binary outcome to each attributes in each predictive characteristic. Dummy correlation check. Once dummies are created, we need to run the correlation check on these dummies. This is done to take care of any significant multicollinearity effects that may exist among the dummies. Correlation coefficient cutoff for dummy correlation is set at 0 0.5. Phase 3 logistic procedure. So this is how the logistic procedure looks like. Model development, model validation, business validation, final implementation. Sometimes we do this for calibration, but it not, not in all the cases. Using model development, we see the multicollinearity check, significance of variable, Hausmann, Lomestro test, concordance, Gini, chaos, divergence indexes, clustering. So lots of tests are there. We'll discuss some of the, these tests, how to interpret their, these tests when we see the logistic output. So, <coughs> multicollinearity. After doing all the derived variables and dummy variables, independent variables, so let's say we are done with the uh, you know 50 variables and which are making sense for our uh, you know why. After that, we can run the multicollinearity. What is multicollinearity? Multicollinearity is a phenomenon where there is a linear relationship between a set of variables. So it might be possible that two variables are coming in the model and they are collinear, they, uh, they are in a high relationship. So, both the variables are providing the same information to the Y, so we are losing the information if we could have the another variable. And due to that, our modeling exercise could be biased, our parameter estimate could be biased, and prediction of Y could be, you know, not robust and stable while it's scoring. So, multicollinearity affects the parameter estimates, making them unreliable. How to detect multicollinearity? Variation, variance in flash factor. And VIF is defined as 1 upon 1 minus R square. How to remove multicollinearity? Look into variance proportion table from the, for the raw row with highest condition index. So, when we run the SAS output, we get the variance in flash factor option VIF in the SAS code and we get the VIF for each variable and we can also put the option of condition index and that can also come in the output. So, when by
variance in inflation table or the row with the highest CI. Identify variables with highest factor loading in the row. Drop the variables which is least significant. So at the industry level, uh, there is a cutoff for very uh, multi-clinicity that is if VIF is greater than 1.75 and 1.75 we can see that there is a multi-clinicity and we can drop that. So logistic procedure variable significance. If you see the output, we see that parameter DF estimates standard error, fault chi square and probability chi square. So based on this p value, we select our variable. Based on 99 and 95 percent confidence interval, we select the our you know variables as we discussed in linear regression also. If we are selecting less than 0.0001 and we are talking about the 99 percent when we are taking increasing those confidence interval or decreasing our p value changes. We uh, after running the logistic regression apart from this p value significance change check we also get the Hosmer Lemusho test which is a very valid test to define that we our model is good fit or not. So null hypothesis that expected values from the model is equal to the observed values from the population. And we test the alternative and we see that what could be. So if you see the box which is rounded, the chi-square for this test is 2.6543. So the beta is the chi-square, the beta is model. So higher the p-value, beta is the model fit. So for First of all, Lemosho goodness of fit test involves dividing the data into approximately 10 groups of roughly equal size based on the percentiles of estimated probabilities. The discrepancies between the observed and expected number of observations, then we use the Pearson chi square statistics and we test that we are able to predict the same expected values as observed or not. So the beta is p value, beta is this test and beta is the Again, there is a concordance. So if you see the percentage concordance is 79.0, it means it's 79%. So concordance is used to assess how well scorecards are separating the good and bad accounts. The higher is the concordance, the larger is the separation of the scores between good and bad accounts. So first when we run the logistic, we look after p-values, we look at the concordance. If it's good, we go with the further checking of the model, uh, you know, goodness of fit. The concordance ratio is a non-negative number which theoretically may lie between 0 to 1. A good concordance is above 60. Logistic procedure. Lorentz curve, Gini and KS. Lorentz curve indicates the list provided by the model over random selection. So, the maximum area the red line covers, the better is the model. Gini coefficient represents the area covered under the Lorentz curve. A good model would have a Gini coefficient between 0.2 to 0.35. When you run the logistic regression in the output, you get C value. So if you multiply that C value by 2 and separate 1, then you get the Gini coefficient. Then there is another test statistic that is chaos. So it's defined as the absolute difference of cumulative percentage of goods and cumulative percentage of bad. KS static value shouldn't be less than 20. Higher the KS, better is the model. But maximum KS less than more than 50 sometimes make the overfit the model. So it should be somewhere in between 20 to 40. L rank ordering. While building the model, we should also take care that when we are grouping our whole uh, prediction into 10 uh, decile, in each decile, the rank order should maintain. The population is divided into the decile in the descending order of predicted values. A model that rank order predicts the highest number of goods in the first decile and then goes progressively down. Models have to rank order completely across development and as well as the validation. Divergence index test. Again, this is a test to see that how well we are going to predict good and bad. So this is an indicator of how well the means of goods and bads are differentiated. Lower the uh, p-value of this divergence test, better is the model. Then we come, after fitting the model, we go for the validation. There are two kind of validation. Validation is scoring the validation sample. 
validation region, region the model and the validation sample, check the chi-square values and the level of significance and the p-values for each explanatory variable. The p-values shouldn't change significantly from the development sample to the validation sample. Check the signs of the parameter estimate. The student change from development sample to the validation sample. Check rank order in both development sample and validation sample should rank order. Validation sample scoring. This is another thing. So rather than running the uh, again code on validation, we can score them. So score the validation sample using the parameter estimates obtained from the scorecard above and run the rank, check the rank ordering. Both development validation samples should have the same rank order. So this is what we discussed about logistic regression and linear regression. Now we'll see what can be the you know, SAS procedure for that. So for proc rig, for proc logistic. So for proc rig, you can, you know, before going through that, I want to say that there is a support.sas.com site. You can go through, you can get all the kind of coding information there. That's why I didn't discuss much about SAS coding. I was much focused on to the interpretation of the result after running the SAS. So for the samples, I have the proc regression code that is model y equal to x1, x2, and then lots of information option like VIF to calculate the variance inflation factor, R collinear for correlation matrix, STB specification influence. These are the different things to check the you know outlier and other things. Output out you can store into the residual that R equal to residual you can see this, get the residual P equal to predicted you can get the predicted variable residual is standard error R student and cooked these are the different other parameters which might be useful for you might not be depends on the scene but in the most exercise we use the proc rig model Y equal to independent <coughs> variables and option VIF cooling influence out out equal to this debt and P equal to predict and nothing more. It's enough for a, you know, the general level of modeling. The same way we have the proc logistic code that data equal to this, out this is descending model y equal to x selection. There could be a different selection. It could be step wise. It could be forward selection, backward selection. But in most of the time in industry, we use the step wise selection. Because in a stepwise selection, at the same time, we, <coughs> if a variable is entering, and it can be go out also. So we do check entering and rejection both. While in forward and backward selection, we only take care of, you know, either entering or removing the variables. All these three selections is on the basis of F test values. You can also provide that your entry and stay, you know, <coughs> SL, SL entry and SL uh, stay significance level. You can provide that it should be 0 0.07 or 0 0.05. You can vary, put anything depends on your experience and the model or situation. You can store your output as a temp. You can you store your predicted values as a new predicted. You can get the C table. C table is basically the confusion matrix table we generate that in reality, let's say you say that, you know, out of 100, you are saying that 10 were good. So after prediction, how many days are exactly mapped as bad? So it's basically the, you know, impurity check that the same, uh, you know, number of bad you are going to predict or not. So based on that, they generate the confusion matrix that we get from the C table option. We can break our P probability in C table given by the range 0 to 1 by 0 0.1. We can vary it also and we can make a cutoff bar to get our results from C table. Out ROC is the ROC one as we discussed in the you know Lorentz curve kind of so we can get the you know uh, ROC curve and we can see that how much bad are we capturing there. So basically we generate the Lorentz curve. <laughs> in appendix two, apart from those outputs which uh, you know explain and we also get the AIC, SIC minus two log likelihood. 
AIC, SIC and modern S2 log likelihood. All these three, if you are comparing the two models of logistic regression, so the minimum AIC better is the model. Minimum SIC better is the model and minus 2 log likelihood are also another parameter to change the model. Minimum minus 2 log likelihood better is the model. Odds ratio we also get as an output in the logistic. So it tells that if your uh, if you are increasing a uh, unit of x, how much you know odds is increasing and that for dependent variable. So this is the reference that you know you can go through that if you want to study further for logistic regression. So all the Ellison logistic regression using SAS system, Alan Agresti for the categorical data analysis, very nice book on logistic regression and David W. Hasmer and Lemestre Applied Logistic Regression. It's also a very nice book. And for uh, you know detailed information you can also check the support.sas.com. That's a very nice site where you can get all the codes, options and even a sample example also. For any further queries if you want to ask, you can mail me at avai.com at excelservice.com or my personal ID abhaikant at gmail.com and you can that. So this is what you know we discussed about regression and logistics. So I have got some questions. Let me see that how can we go through that questions. So I am interested in SAS and want to know more about it also. I want to know how much it is there demand of DIP and DI in technical market is the other tools and the software available. So answering your question, I think it's a Answering to that question, I can only say that, you know, SAS is a very powerful tool and in the market of BI, B and DI, it's a very valuable tool and highly demandable tool. You can do anything, anything means anything in the SAS using data. So, and in market, it's available, you can get it, uh, you know, for a month free at a GMP software also, you can, you know, but it's very costly if you get a licensed one of the SAS, the new version that is the SAS 9.1.3. Another question I have from Haskar that regression modeling will help to the business analysis. So as we discussed that in regress, uh, regression can help us to understand that how our you know data is providing the insight. So in the, I, as I took some example from bank, as the same way you can take the example from healthcare also, that let's say you want to see that what kind of medicine, what kind of diagnosis, what kind of providers, vendors are going to impact your health, how much money you are going to pay in the next year, what is the probability you are going to die or not die, if you get this problem or not, something like that. So you can answer those questions using regression analysis. It's a very powerful tool to predict something as a continuous and discrete. So if you want to get any kind of you know, relationship between your data, you can use the regression analysis and get those information. I think, Bhaskar, that is the answer of your question. Another I have from STDJK that what if I want to build a model with multiple exercise? So as we discussed that we can use the multiple exercise and how we can treat the data we discussed. Lots of you know data treatment, broke univariate, fine classing, core classing, multicularity, outlier treatment, missing value treatment. So I think now it's clear for you after having this session. Another I have, are there other methods too for prediction? Yes, of course. So this question was asked by Bhupen. 
so of course we have another tools so regression is a wide range of you know statistical technology within logistic regression we have lots of logistic procedure which deals with like we can deal with ordinal response we can deal with nominal response we can deal with the curvilinear relationships we can deal with the spline regression we can deal with the conditional we can deal with the conditional logistic we can deal with the you know discrete order logistic regression also so there are lots of if you want to if you have a time frame data you can have the cox proportion hazard regression model to see the survival analysis that if a person is going to die then what is the time and how much a loan is going to pay default something like that so you we have the survival analysis we have lots of you know machine learning courses like new neural network gbm svm they are the uh, they are predicting well we have the decision tree tools also which are the useful for the prediction so lots of tool uh, you know open that i think that 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 answers your question now prabhu has asked one question how does regression apply to inventory management in detail stores yeah nice question so is inventory management stores let's say you want to you want to see that how much levis you know t-shirt you want to keep in your store so that's that could be answered by regression you want to see that over the weekends how many people will come on how many people will come if you want to go through the logistic that your this brand of logistic uh, your this brand of levis t-shirt will sell or not into the market this could be answered through the logistic so you can manage your inventory you know using regression so that that that's your answer, you know answer of your question in a, uh, then arun is asking a question that in a live example how is the risk score card different in analytics environment versus in the sql environment so varun in the sql environment we have to write all these things which we discussed as a manual coding and then you can you know do it you with your own way to predict them to find out the equation something like that you deal with the matlab you deal with the r something like that so it's a totally different environment there you have to write everything is manual but here in sas you get lots of options and you can play through that option after treating the data i think that's an uh, answer of your question akshita jaksin that may know which book is good to learn logistic regression with examples given so as i suggested that you can learn from the applied logistic regression agras the applied logistic regression emotional emotional and you can also get a lots of book on google it's a e book and there is a lots of saas printing books are in the market with the saas examples you can uh, you know get those books uh, from saas institute you can order that book there is a one book that is the data mining cookbook you can go through that not lots of you know healthy examples are there with the saas examples i think i think the achita you got your So, what is asking, sir? What are the relevant statistical data interpretation when evaluating e auction data? So, Prashant, answering to your question, you know, uh, when we are dealing with e auction data, so it comes under the web analytics tool, and we can uh, gather the information through the many you know sites that. visited your site how many times he visited how what was the frequency when he visited and what he wanted so lots of data you can gather through the web analytics using sql and web trends pull those data into the saas again start your regression and logistic regression based on your scenario that exactly what you want the, uh, to predict uh, you know uh, for your customers but most of the time in e auction data we uh, go through the prediction also and we first you know segment the data and we come up with the segmentation technique that how the profile looks like for different customer and based on those different segmentation we come up with a 
different technique of prediction of each segmentation. So it totally depends that how you are going to you know choose your e option data and what's your business objective. If you have any further queries, you can reach out to me. And I think that's all the questions I have. And if you have any questions, you can ask right now. Otherwise, case so you can you know take over the calls and you know further proceed. And thanks, guys, that are coming in the peak time of the working days and attending the session. I hope that it is. Thanks Mr. Abir for your informative session on predictive analytics using regression. It was indeed an enlightening session. I would also like to thank our participants for the support in making this webinar a huge success. The recording of this webinar will be available on techgeek.com by tomorrow. The next session in the Business Intelligence Webinar Series is happening Thursday at 17 November at 3 p.m. Topic for the webinar is Trends in Business Intelligence and Retail Business Intelligence. We will be having Mr. Krishan Vinayak, Global Head, Business Intelligence at Marlevs as our guest speaker. So see you all tomorrow at 3 p.m. Have a nice day. Thank you.